Jesus has been on a bit of a journey recently. In the last couple of chapters, he has been all over the place. He's been up in Tyre and Sidon, which was, uh, which was Gentile spaces, you know, so not Jewish areas. He's been in Galilee, he's been walking across the water. I mean, that's quite an impressive one. He's been along the coast at Caesarea. And this is a culture where actually traveling around was less frequent. So, um, so here in this passage that we're about to hear, Jesus comes back to somewhere that's a little bit, what's well, a bit like home. So he comes back again to Galilee. So the disciples would have had friends and family members there. They'd be back in an area where they'd worked. Often all the fishermen, they were in this area. It's an area where they can relax a bit. Comfort. Oh, isn't it lovely when you go back to an area you know well? It's like a comfortable old pair of shoes. So they journeyed back, probably looking forward to spending their time somewhere quite comfortable. So Jesus didn't have a car, he didn't have a train, a taxi, or any easy way of getting around that we might have today. He relied on walking. If he wanted to go somewhere, it was a real effort. It would have taken planning, timing, and you don't just make those journeys, kind of unless there's a really good reason. And we think we have it bad. I mean, my kids got to the age now when actually leaving the house is, is not as much of a chore as it was a couple of years ago. But, you know, we've got a big seven-seater car. And every time we went away for more than a weekend, I'd sit there and go, crikey, I need a van. You know, we've always got, um, you know, we always had wipes and nappies and spare chairs, changes of clothes and shoes and boots and clothes for all weathers and circumstances. And going anywhere, even if it was just a church, it was a real effort. We often thought when we packed to go somewhere for the afternoon, it looked like we were going for a weekend in Wales. And as, as Jesus and the disciples and other followers and I don't know, who knows, maybe animals, whenever they travel, we get no indication really of, um, of what they need to take with them. So we know from some of the Bible passages that sometimes Jesus' suggestion is take less than, the, than you need and then you're relying on other people's hospitality. That's a big ask. But all this traveling may have taken its toll. You know, people didn't move around as much. You know, it'd be so much hard work journeying. You have to journey for a reason. We've talked about that quite a, a bit recently. You wouldn't just journey for fun. You know, people didn't go on holidays. It's a very modern idea, the idea of a holiday. So when you're moving, when you're on the move, it's, um, it's hard work. Especially if you go into a place that's a little bit alien, a little bit different. But here, it's a place of comfort. You know, food you know, areas you know, houses you know. You know, I find it quite hard being uh, in, in, a, in a new house or a new area with people I don't know very well. You know, you've got to be on your guard. You've got to, got to be well behaved, as I keep on being told. But here, they're in a moment of comfort. Oh, it's beautiful. But, you know, that doesn't seem to be a moment of looking back. It doesn't mean, seem to be here a moment of, of enjoying the home comforts. This is a time for looking forwards. We're going to read these two short verses and we're going to hear that Jesus uses this setting of comfort to really make his disciples feel a little uncomfortable. When they came together in Galilee, he said to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and on the third day he will be raised to life. And the disciples were filled with grief. So it says in that passage that they came together in Galilee, the most comfortable of places, a place where maybe they could have some relaxation, some comfortable food, everything we've been talking about. A moment for... Oh, chill and relax. But Jesus, oh, he drops a truth bomb on them, you know, and 
they've just had this strange moment um, earlier where they had failed to heal a boy, or well, the disciples had, and Jesus healed him where the disciples weren't able to. They were possibly a little bit low after that, and now Jesus brings this news again, much like in Matthew 16, that he will die and be raised on the third day. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. It's a strange statement from Jesus, really. It gives the disciples a little bit more information than they had received before. I don't know if you spotted it. Jesus here predicts his own death three times to the disciples in the Gospel of Matthew. This is the second time and the shortest account. Did you spot the extra information? Well, let's quickly pop back to Matthew 16 to look at the wording that was used there. So Matthew 16, 21 says, From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. So that's longer. And here in chapter 17, we're given just this little hint, this little extra nugget of information that Jesus will be handed over. He'll be betrayed, maybe by men or a man into the hands of other men. And this is, it just screams humanity here. Um, and not in a good way. This is the, the sort of the human faults in essence. You know, he uses the phrase son of man many times in the gospel narratives, but by doing so, he's pointing back to the Old Testament, you know, where it promises, it mentions, or it points to a son of man over a hundred times. And in this short statement here, in the most comfortable of settings, Jesus lets his followers know that he will be handed over, he, the son of man, will be handed over to men and will die at the hands of men. And this speaks massively against the way that the disciples would imagine a Messiah coming. They imagine conquering. They imagine booting the Romans out. They don't imagine this Messiah being killed by humanity. That just doesn't fit probably with their view of what the Messiah might be. And even more shockingly here, Jesus is walking slowly towards this moment. He isn't avoiding it, he's choosing it. The disciples, it says, are filled with grief. A phrase that Matthew doesn't use often, it really stands out, they were filled with grief. They understand the death. Now they don't seem to understand that Jesus is choosing this himself. They don't seem to understand um, the phrase in there, like the first time in chapter 16, that he will rise three days later. So they ignore um, the mentions of rising again. They don't seem to understand that. And, you know, that makes sense. I get that. Um, you know, but in this most comfortable of places, they seem fixated on the fact that this Messiah is going to die and it fills them with grief. Jesus uses this place of comfort and security, a place they know so well. He uses this moment to change that comfort to grief with a pointer to truth. And then after this passage, they move on again as they journey with Jesus back to Jerusalem. <laughs>